The next question we're going to have a look at is this mathematical induction proof. Proof for all uh, n, which is a subset or is an element of the positive integers by mathematical induction. And then you've got this uh, use of sigma notation here, which we then need to unpack. Now, this question was done reasonably well, so I won't dwell too much on this solution, but let's have a look at how the steps unfold. Here's uh, where we begin. We've got our statement written right here uh, that this simutation over here, when expanded out, should sum to give us this particular expression on the right hand side. So, as most uh, proofs by induction begin, I want to take my base case, I want to evaluate that, verify that it's true, um, I'll make my assumption, and then most of the work is going to be in the proof step as usual. So noting that my, uh, I'm saying that if we go back to the question, we have that this is true for all um, positive integer values of n. Um, I have to think carefully because we know an extension 2, and this comes up much bigger later on in the test, that uh, extension 2 includes the um, proofs by induction where the base case is not always n equals 1. But luckily for us, in this particular one, uh, the first positive integer we can think of is exactly n equals 1. So we go ahead, test it out. Here's the left hand side, me putting into, there's my uh, r starts at 1 and then you know goes up to 1 and then it stops because I've already hit n equals 1, so this is the left hand side evaluated. And then here comes the right hand side and it's a straightforward substitution, uh, n only appears a couple of times. So there is the substitution and you end up with 3 on both sides, which you would hope is the case. Here comes the assumption, um, I've just gone ahead and I've assumed it for n equals k, so that's why you can see the k up here, here once, and then twice, and then three times. And now, we then have to say, well, if we want to use that assumption, what are we trying to prove? And we're trying to prove the k plus one step here. So you can see there is the first substitution, the second, uh, and then over here, you just have to be mindful of the fact that really, this is going to be 2k plus 2 minus 1, that 2k plus 2 comes from the 2 multiplied by k plus 1, uh, and then that minus 1 there gives us 2k plus 1 as a whole. Of course, you could have put an extra step in there if you wanted. All right, uh, what's the, sta the, the sort of the strategy that I'm using here? Well, um, I start with the left-hand side of my k plus 1 step, and because the left-hand side is written in sigma notation, it makes it easy to kind of separate out the assumption from the part that's different, and then I need to um, work with the assumption, make a substitution, um, as you're about to see. So what have I done here? As you can see on the right-hand side, I have taken this sigma notation, which goes previously from 1, up to k plus 1, and I've said, well, let's look at the first k terms, just leave them within sigma notation, and then separate out that final term, the k plus 1th term. Uh, k plus 1st term? No, k plus 1th term, okay? So there it is there, k plus 1 times 3 to the k plus 1. You can see me just substituting in k plus 1 into that sigma notation formula right there. And the reason why it's helpful to separate, separate out this sigma notation bit here up to um, n equals k is because that's what I had in my assumption, right? So here it is, right there, that's my assumption that all of that, the first k terms, equals this on the right hand side. So that's why you can see right in here, this is me using the assumption. So there's the substitution which replaces my sigma notation here. So this is handy because now I have a whole bunch of like terms which if I can expand this out, um, they're going to all uh, arrive and, and sort of cancel together or interact. So let's have a look. You can see at this point here, all I'm trying to do is expand these brackets on the inside. And while I'm at it, um, I can see I've got 3 to the k terms coming up here and here. Um, but I've got a 3 to the k plus 1 term over here on the right hand side. So what have I done? I've taken the 3 to the 1 that's been multiplied through on this original term. And I've multiplied it through by the, the terms in the brackets. So that's why the k plus 1 turns into a 3k plus 3. Uh, at this point down here, I then notice, okay, I've got a three quarters factorized out here, um, and I don't have it here, so if I were to put it in place uh, on both spots, um, the reason why that's better than, you know, say, trying to expand out this is because I think I have one eye on what I'm proving, uh, the algebra I'm manipulating right now, and I also have another eye on the destination that I have in mind. And if you have a think back, this is the result we're trying to prove. It's got a three quarters out the front, so I'm not going to get rid of that. So I might as well factorize out three quarters for everything. And so that's what I've done right here. 
3 clay, th 3k plus 3 is of course 3 quarters of 4k plus 4. So that's me getting the uh, 3 quarters in position here and here. Once I've got it in both spots, I then factorize it out here. So that's where this comes from, from this term and this one. And uh, what ensues is just me writing out each of the terms inside the brackets that have been factorized out. So here comes the 1, 3 to the k, 2k, uh, minus 3 to the k. And then uh, you have to be careful here because even though I've factorized out the 3 quarters, you still have this 3 to the k hanging out on the end. So that's why I get 3 to the k, 4k, and the 3 to the k, I've got 4 of them here. Okay. Now you can see by my underlining, I've got the zigzags and then I've also got the double lines. Uh, I'm trying to collect like terms at this point. So here are my um, terms which involved the 3 to the k's and also k's. So they're going to go together. And then here are my 3 to the k's with a constant term. So in this case, I've got negative one of them and here I've got four of them. So you can see that it combines in, let's see if I can um, highlight this helpfully. Here are my um, 3 to the k terms by themselves and they turn into this, I've got 2k plus 4k equals 6k. Uh, and then in a similar way, you can see how uh, these two terms combine here. It's four take away one, which gives me three. All right, now this is really great, but I do notice that if I, again, go back to what I'm trying to prove, what I'm trying to prove here, it's got, it doesn't have three to the k terms. It's got three to the k plus one terms. So in other words, I've got to take 3 to the k and I've got to multiply it by 3 and index laws will take care of the rest. So that's why you can see um, for each of these two terms, for this one it's very easy, there's just already a 3 there so it goes up into the index. For this one, um, I pull the 3 out and that leaves a 2k behind. So now I've also got this up in the index. Uh, and at this point, it is just a straightforward factorization to say I've got 2k of them here, I've got one of them there, and here is the required result. So um, you know, if I were nice and neat, I would say, um, it's true by the principle of mathematical induction. And as mentioned, uh, this was probably one of the best done mathematical induction questions uh, because it was relatively straightforward if you were able to correctly interpret the sigma notation, which most people had no trouble with. Okay, full stop. Let's go back to the paper and have a look at the next question on the next page. 5C says, uh, prove that, and we're back in complex numbers land, prove that the modulus of Z1Z2, the product, uh, or rather the modulus of a product, equals uh, modulus Z1, modulus Z2. Prove that the modulus of a product equals the product of the moduli for any complex number. So we're going to do that, um, and then we're going to prove another result which we'll use in a graph, apparently, in part three. So let's have a look at the solutions one at a time. Here is um, the what was I saying? The modulus of the product that we were looking at before. So I have been told, if I come back to the question, I shouldn't get rid of it so quickly. Um, it says, prove that this is true, and it then says kind of do it however you like. Uh, it doesn't specify any particular process, unlike part two, which says use the rectangular form of a, or the, you know, the Cartesian form of a complex number. So when I'm multiplying numbers together, the most concise way to do that is using exponential form. So you can see me specifying, well, let's call Z1 this, and z2 that, when you multiply them together, it's straightforward index laws to then say, okay, I'm just going to have my e to the i alpha, my e to the i beta, they become e to the i, alpha plus beta, um, and then my uh, moduli out the front here, which I defined as r1 and r2, um, they're just going to combine there. Now what's great about this line is, if you read it carefully, you can see it's asking for something very straightforward. What is the distance from the origin of this particular complex number. Well, the distance from the origin doesn't have anything to do, it's independent of the argument of that complex number. It only has to do with this numerical coefficient at the front. So the modulus of this particular complex number is just that coefficient r1, r2. So I've got that, and I noticed that r1 is the modulus of z1 by definition, and the same thing for r2 and Z2, so that's uh, the modulus of Z1 and the modulus of Z2 done as required. Now, as I pointed out in part two, um, it is specified that you have to use rectangular form. And really, that's just to make things a bit easier for you um, because you could have done this in exponential form, but it will make the transition to part three ever so slightly trickier. 
If I say z equals x plus i y, that implies in rectangular form that the conjugate of z is equal to x minus i y. I'm just flipping around the sign on the imaginary term. Now the reason why I bother to write this is because you can see here this result depends on uh, using z and then comparing it to its conjugate and of course I have to square as well, right? And then hopefully where I end up with is 4ixy. So let's see how that unfolds. You can see here, here's my z minus z bar, and because I have defined uh, z and z bar in this way, um, all you get left with is, like because the uh, when you're subtracting, the two real parts were identical, so they cancel each other out. So that's great, I just get left with the imaginary bits, 2iy, and the opposite is true when I'm adding the uh, complex conjugates. When I've got z plus z bar, you can see the iy and the minus iy, they just cancel, and that's what leaves me with 2x. So then you multiply through and you get 4ixy as needed. So then we come to part three and I hope as you looked at the question you saw um, how you were going to need to use parts one and two. Um, part two is easy uh, or more obvious rather I should say to use. You can see over here on the uh, left hand side of what we're asked to graph here there's that same z squared minus z bar squared um, that we used in part two or rather that we proved a result for in part two. So um, this is clearly implying that if I, if I take this and substitute it for what's on the right hand side, for ixy, that's gonna make this easier, which indeed it does. So let's have a look at how this pans out. Here is me substituting in for ixy, and I got that from part two. Um, it's equal to 16. I noticed that that four, because it's a positive coefficient, I can just divide everything through by four, which is what gives me the next line. From the modulus of ixy, I now use part one. Part one told me that if I've got some modulus of a product, I can just break up that product into however many pieces that I want, and then take the moduli independently. And so that's what I'm doing here. You can, you can see, excuse me, I pulled out i, which is its own complex number, and xy, which is also some complex number, who knows what it is, and um, because I've got the uh, product of these two moduli um, equal to the modulus of the product, I can very easily determine, oh, wait a second, the uh, modulus of i is just one, because if you think of where i is, here's my quick and dirty argand diagram, it's just one unit above the origin on the complex planes. So that is why its modulus is one. Once I have that fact established, um, I'm just getting the absolute value of xy being equal to four. Now you need to think about this carefully. Um, when you're thinking about moduli and absolute value, what that essentially means is I want all the things that when I just look at their raw magnitude, I don't worry about direction anymore. Um, when I think about their magnitude or their distance from the origin, I should get four. Well there's exactly two real numbers that do that, and I'm thinking about real numbers because I've got x and y, both of which are, um, have to be real by definition. Um, x and y can be either positive four or negative four. Both of those numbers, both of those numbers on the real um, number line are exactly four units away from the origin. So they both satisfy, both these numbers satisfy this equation. Once you've got the plus or minus four there, it's just a matter of dividing through by x, and we get a familiar hyperbola that we know how to graph, except there's two of them, right? You can see here, let's highlight it, uh, this would be the four over x part. We're pretty used to that hyperbola, so I'll just um, label it as such, four over x. And then secondly, you also have this reflected one. This here is a separate hyperbola. It's y equals negative four over x. You can see I've just turned it upside down. And it was a very common error for students to um, miss the fact that there were m more branches than you would normally get for a hyperbola. So just before I leave off this question, it is worth pointing out that um, missing the uh, absolute value and the fact that you get both the plus and the minus, that was one major factor. Um, also, not putting in your asymptotes, that was just kind of sloppy, so it was very disappointing to see asymptotic behavior, but no asymptotes actually you know, drawn in and labeled on the graph. And then lastly, as a very, very small point, um, but it is, I think, if you know, I'm trying to show you a perfect uh, a specimen solution is what we call it, um, this graph here, um, and all of its branches here, 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 and here, it could just as easily have been plus or minus one over x, or plus or minus five over x, or plus or minus 500 over x. They all look like this. The only difference is the scale. So that's why I've put a point for scale, or some people like to call it a locking point. Um, now that I have placed this on this first branch, um, only y equals four over x can satisfy that. This can't be y equals uh, five over x anymore because um, the point two plus two i wouldn't be on there. 
Uh, and that's how you do this graph. Not complicated to draw, but you had to think about how to use all of your earlier parts, which was a consistent issue throughout this exam. Um, there were lots of multi-part questions and better responses, stronger responses, always kept in mind their previous results and also uh, quoted them, made them really clear, right? You can see here, um, I state very explicitly, there's part two, that's where I use it, when I said, oh, I'm substituting from here to here. Here's part one, when I said I broke apart this modulus of a product into the product of the moduli. Tell me where that's coming from. That's a really good practice to clearly communicate your mathematical working.